Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Natalia Lee and I'm an indie author and freelance editor. And today I'm going to be giving you some tips for editing your first draft. And this doesn't necessarily have to only apply to your first draft. You can absolutely go through these like tips or go through this um, process multiple times. You can use this to edit your second draft or third draft. Heck, I just finished editing my sixth draft. More than anything, these are like content and developmental editing tips and how to really look at your book from a like story perspective, kind of figure out if your characters are working, if your plot is working, and then learn how to structure it and change things in rewrites in order to make that book a hundred times stronger. Keep in mind that every writer does something a little bit different. These tips might not work perfectly for you, but there are so many other ways to kind of approach content edits and developmental edits. So feel free to check out some other videos, you know, some other writers, learn how other people do it, but this is how I do it and it works incredibly well for me. So if you want to learn how to do developmental editing of your own novel, if you wanna learn how to edit your first draft, then just keep watching. All right, let's get started. Okay, this first tip, the first thing that I do, and you've probably heard this everywhere, and I'll admit I don't always follow my own advice just depending on kind of my publishing process, my timeline, um, but the first thing that I recommend you do before diving into a heavy developmental edit is to let the story sit. After we finish writing a book, we're typically very close to it. It's kind of the whole idea of like you can't see the forest for the trees because you are so involved in the story that you can't really see how it's all working together and how the pieces are either like gliding together seamlessly or if there's kind of something going wrong and the story's not working. If you're too close to it, you're not gonna be able to see that. So my first piece of advice, the first thing that I would do is to give it time to sit. All right, my second tip, the second thing I always do is I always print my story out and you could do this in different ways. My preference is to get a KDP proof copy and I actually have Song of the Dryad here today. This is a very early copy of the book. This was the second proof copy that I printed. So you'll see that it does not have the final cover. This was um, a cover that I created, kind of a mock-up that I sent to my cover designers. But when you print out your book, whether you're printing it out on computer paper, you know, and getting it bound at your printing shop, or whether you're getting a proof copy like this, like mine, there's something about seeing your words on paper that just feels different. There isn't quite as much to distract you. Like, you know, you could take your book and go sit at the beach or go sit in your cozy chair in the living room or cuddle up in bed and you can read your book and work on it without having a laptop in front of you, without being distracted by the internet, without all of those bright lights and everything else that kind of pulls you away from your novel. So I will always recommend that when you're about to edit, get yourself a physical copy. If I have a physical book in front of me, along with a red pen or your pen of choice, it, it just feels different than sitting in front of the computer like you have been the entire time you've been writing. Like when you see this in the flesh and you see this printed out and you see all of your hard work and you can you know bust out this red pen and start making all your edit notes, it makes everything feel so real. It kind of, puts things into perspective. You see how much work you did and you can feel that you're on to the next stage of the journey. And of course, if this doesn't work for you for any reason, my other recommendation, aside from just reading it, like aside from just reading your book in, you know, Microsoft Word or Scrivener or wherever, would be to put it on an e-reader. Um, I have a Nook and a Kindle, so I sometimes will put my work on my Kindle or I used to put it on my Nook before I got the Kindle, um, and that helped as well because it was different than reading it in the word processor, and uh, that's, that's gonna help me lead into my next tip, which is to read through your novel without making any changes. And if you have your word processor open in front of you, you're gonna start reading and you're gonna see things that you wanna change, and you're just gonna immediately go to work trying to change those things. You know, if you don't like the sentence structure here, or if this sounds awkward, or, oh, I'm gonna cut this whole paragraph, you don't wanna do that right away. My recommendation will always be to read through your entire novel 
before you make a single change. What I really like about having a proof copy or paper that you can write on is while you're reading, you can be taking notes right in the pages and like circling things, highlighting misspelled words, writing notes to yourself. And that's what I like to do and that's perfectly okay. But you don't wanna go through and start changing things yet because I used to do that in the past. I would, you know, start reading my book and I'd find something that I wanted to change and I'd go and immediately change it and then start reading again. Um, and I would get myself very confused. I wouldn't know what had been changed or where I was. And then I would have to print the book again and start fresh because I didn't remember what I had changed. And while you're going through and doing your reread, whether you're doing it in a proof copy or on an e-reader, wherever you're doing this, this is gonna sound kind of tedious, but I recommend that you make a note like summarizing what happens in every single chapter and you'll need this later on so I recommend that you do this either write it down like in a notebook or take sticky notes and write down a summary of every single chapter and that's going to come into play a little bit later okay moving forward now you have read your entire book you've highlighted spelling errors maybe you've made notes for yourself you have summarized every chapter because that's really important the next step after having done all this is to take that chapter summary and put it up somewhere. You can put it in a Scrivener file. You can put it on a whiteboard. You'll see I have one down there. That's my Whiskey City outline. But take the summary of every single chapter and put it somewhere. My recommendation is going to be putting it in a visual place. I really like using sticky notes or you can use note cards if you have like a cork board because you can move things around. And the idea of this is to be able to lay out your outline in front of you and essentially see a snapshot of your entire novel from beginning to end. And it makes it much easier to work on large scale developmental edits because you can see everything in a very simplified, very clean outline. Even if you're not a plotter, I think this is important because you've written you know, your first draft Maybe you pants to the whole thing, but now you need to know what's in that story and you need to know how you've structured that story. So that's why the chapter by chapter outline is really helpful. And a lot of pantsers will say, you know, I don't want uh, a plot or an outline to ruin the fun of writing. But if you've already written that first draft, now you're moving into the, uh, the nitty gritty editing. And of course you can always discover new things through editing, but even if you are a pantser, I recommend that you write down a chapter summary of everything, you know, while you're doing your read through and then organize it in a visual way. You're gonna read through that outline again, get a very brief kind of basic idea of what this story is. And then now we're gonna start moving into the, uh, the more difficult aspect. And that is looking at your character arcs and looking at your plot as a whole. So after you read your book, some questions you might want to ask yourself are, what does my character want? I've talked about this before, you know, it's very important in a novel that your main character has a strong want. They need a goal. And on top of that goal, we need to know what is standing in their way. What is keeping them from that goal? So that's the next question. What does your main character want and what is standing in their way? Because you need something standing in the way of getting that goal. So you can write these questions down and actually answer them or just go over them kind of in your mind. What does my main character want? what is standing in their way. And a third question, a really important one to think about is what's going to happen if my character doesn't get what they want? You know, are they going to lose their house? Is the world going to end? Is Voldemort going to take over? Like what is going to happen if your character fails on their quest to get what they want? Because if you want your readers really rooting for your main character, we need to know what's at stake. So there has to be a want slash goal and there have to be tangible stakes. We have to know what is at stake if your character fails. Moving forward, there is often an antagonist standing in the way of your character getting what they want. So you can always have like person versus self or person versus environment. Those are two different types of conflict, but they are still, they still have antagonists. But if you have a person versus person conflict, like Harry Potter versus Voldemort, for example, then you want to ask yourself, what does your antagonist want? The number one way to have an antagonist that falls flat on their face and that nobody is afraid of is to have an antagonist that's a bad guy just because he wants to be a bad guy. That is not good enough. 
Your antagonist slash villain needs to want something, and what they want has to put them in opposition with what your main character wants, because that's going to bring them into conflict with each other, and you want conflict. It doesn't matter what genre of story you're writing, it doesn't matter what you've written, there needs to be some sort of conflict. You know, the villain could be the landlord that's about to kick your main character out of her house, or it could be Voldemort trying to take over the world. So there are varying levels, but we need to have a villain that has a want, and we need to know why they want that thing, and that want has to put them into direct conflict with your main character. So by asking yourself those questions and answering those questions, you can take a closer look at your main character and your villain, you can look at other characters within the novel, and make notes to yourself about whether or not you achieved that. Or do you need to go back and rewrite some of these characters to make sure that they have strong wants, they have something at stake, and there is constant conflict, or not constant, but there is conflict. They're coming up against somebody else that probably wants the opposite of what they do. So that's going to help you look at character. So these next few things are going to look more specifically at plot. You've looked at your characters, now we're looking at plot. And I do recommend, if you are somebody who doesn't really know how to outline, doesn't know how to plot, needs a little bit of help, get Save the Cat Writes a Novel. I have it linked down below. It's linked in all of my videos. This book has changed my plotting life. I could not recommend it more. Hands down, the best book on outlining I have ever read. Get it down below if you're interested in learning more about outlining, but um, we're not gonna go over all those beats. I'm gonna mention some of the main beats though, some of the big ones that you wanna make sure your novel has. The first is the inciting incident. There has to be something to take your character and their normal mundane life and push them into the new world. If there's not an inciting incident, then there's no reason for the story to take place and nothing is pushing your character into the new world. Nothing is pushing Harry to Hogwarts to learn about his wizarding life and his wizarding family. There has to be something that sets the, sets the story in motion, essentially. So you need your inciting incident. And you can look at your outline for all of these and figure out, okay, do I actually have this? If so, where is it? And if not, where does it need to go? Inciting incident. The next thing you need is your rising action. This is where everything, you know, gets going. Your character's in the new world. This could also be kind of referred to as the promise of the premise. So if somebody picked up your romance novel, they are going to expect romance to be happening over the course of that book. If they picked up a fantasy about fairies, they're going to expect to see fairies. You know, you don't want to promise somebody a romance and then have no romance happening, or promise somebody a fairy fantasy and not have any fairies show up until halfway through the book. So with this rising action and promise of the premise, you are delivering on what your reader expected when they picked up your novel. So you can ask yourself, you know, what's my genre? What is my blurb? If you don't already have one, this could it could be helpful to write one at this point. Um, and am I delivering on that genre? And am I kind of delivering to readers' expectations? The next thing you need, number three, is a crisis slash darkest moment. This is when your character is at their very lowest, their very lowest. They hit rock bottom. And from rock bottom, the only thing they can do is give up or die or... <laughs> turn it around. And once they hit that darkest moment and they decide to turn it around, they can't go any lower than rock bottom, that is when we have our climax. That is the big finale, the big moment, and you need to make sure that that climax, again, is delivering on the promise of the premise. You know, is it a climax of Harry Potter and Voldemort having their last gigantic battle, you know, in the final book, and Harry finally finally vanquishing that evil. That is the big climax, right? So what happens in your book and is it a big enough moment to then push us kind of over the roller coaster and into our falling action? So after that big moment happens, we're kind of going to be tying up subplots if they're not already tied up, you know, tidying everything and tying it off with a little bow and kind of coasting to the end of the novel. So there are so many more beats than this. These are just like five of the main ones. And again, if you want more help with outlining, grab yourself a copy of Save the Cat. It will change your life, I promise. After you have gone through, you know, looking at your characters, looking at your plot, now it's time to return to your outline. And this is why I love to have my outline on note cards or sticky notes that I can move around 
because once you take this deeper look into, okay, do I need more character development? Do I need a stronger premise? Do I need a, you know, a, a lower, deeper, darker, darkest moment where my character hits rock bottom? If you need those things, then this is the perfect moment to write that out on your note cards and start moving your outline around. You know, okay, I need to take these 10 chapters and move them back so that I can input these two new chapters, right? On your two fresh sticky notes or note cards or whatever. So I always like to use this visual method of outlining after having written my book so that I can move things around, play with it. And then when I finally get back to my novel, I can literally just grab those 10 chapters and move them and input brand new, you know, two brand new chapters. And I recommend that you do all of this still before you touch your novel. You know, you are taking what your story actually has, you're breaking it apart, you're adding new things. And after you do that, after you have this new outline in a way, you have your new sticky notes or note cards or what have you, then it is finally time. It is finally time to go back to your Word document and actually start implementing all of these changes. Step number eight or tip number eight would be to have a plan as you move forward with editing this first draft of your novel. So something that I like to do um, after having you know moved my outline around, I like to make a checklist essentially of things that I know I need to do or things that I need to add. Something else that helps me is if I write down something like, you know, Charlotte really wants to save her mom, but what's getting in her way is blah, blah, blah. I don't want to reveal too much about Song of the Dryad, but, you know, having that written out and printed and, you know, stuck up on my wall or taped to my desk, or maybe it's in a Word document that I can pull up every time I start editing to remind me of what this story is, remind me of what I am trying to achieve with this edit, and essentially keep me on track. Because especially if you are editing a big, long monstrosity of a novel, you might find yourself getting distracted and getting confused about, okay, what was I really supposed to be doing here? So having a checklist and having kind of like an overarching plan and having that printed out and in a place where you can easily access it and see it, whether you want to tape it to your desk or write it in your, you know, bullet journal or something, I find that incredibly helpful. Keeps me focused, keeps me on track, and I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing while I am tackling the massive developmental edits that my books usually always need. Number nine is just like an additional little tip, and that is to work linearly, just like work from beginning to end. And this is not gonna work for everybody. I know that some people like to jump around, but I've tried jumping around before and you can get confused very easily and very fast. If I edit something in chapter two and then I jump to chapter 10 and then I'm back to chapter five, I'm starting to get confused about when things are happening, how many chapters I've edited, what I added to each chapter, and that could easily make it even more difficult to do another round of edits. You know, I could muddy my novel so badly that I have to start from, you know, page one and do it all over again. So my tip is to always just work from page one to page 500, just work in a straight line while you're editing. It's not gonna work for everybody, but personally, that's the best method that I have found and the best way to not get confused and to really keep on track while you're editing. Number 10, my last tip for the day, my last tip for this video is once you're done with your developmental edits, do another quick read through, clean up any spelling errors you see. You don't have to print it out for this phase in the process because you're just doing a very quick read through and cleanup, essentially preparing your novel for beta readers. I always recommend using beta readers before you go to the uh, developmental editor if you're going to hire a developmental editor because you want your story to be as clean and as developed as possible before you're sending it off to an expensive professional editor. So when you're done with this big rewrite, this big developmental edit, do another read through. You know, you can put it away for a little while if you want to, but typically at this stage, personally, I get very excited for betas. 
um, because you're going to be preparing your book for beta readers. And if you want to learn more about how to work with beta readers, how to find beta readers, what to expect from your beta readers, etc. Make sure that you are subscribing to my channel. You can do that right down here and you are hitting the little bell notification because that way you will be notified when my beta reader video goes live. You guys can expect that very soon. I'll also have a bunch of other videos out on formatting and editing and all kinds of good stuff. So once your book is done and ready for betas, then you have to let it go. You have to give it to your readers and then you're gonna do multiple rounds of edits after that. So there's still a long way to go, a lot to do, but I hope that you found this kind of 10 step uh, <laughs> approach to developmental editing helpful. I know that it can feel like you're drowning while you're working through developmental edits and just know that we've all been there, we've all experienced it, and hopefully these 10 tips will help you break it down into manageable chunks. If you guys have any questions, any requests for content, make sure to leave them in the comments down below. If you didn't already know, I am a freelance editor. You can check out my services at enchantedinkpublishing.com or you can click the little link that will pop up right here at the end of the video. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining me today. Good luck editing your novels and I will see you in my next video. Bye.